So I'm a researcher interested in artificial intelligence. I would like to build a constructive model of the human brain, understand how human reasoning works. And I work with little robots to try and help me understand that. So now, why am I doing this? I'm doing this because there's a paradox in artificial intelligence. Just last week, uh, Google AlphaGo program made big news because it was the first time that a computer program beat Lee Sedol, one of the best Go players in the world, in Go. And uh, that has been an extension of previous work where first uh, in 1996, uh, Deep Thought from IBM beat uh, Kasparov in chess, and now last week Google AlphaGo managed to beat the human world champion in Go. And the reaction from the media, from uh, people, researchers, has been all over the place quite predictably. So some of them said, well, this is the new utopia. Soon we will have robots that will fulfill our every whim. And other people said, oh, no. Now they're going to become self-aware. They're going to kill us all. Um, and of course, anything in between those two extreme views. But one has to realize that in spite of the fact that the achievement of the AlphaGo team was a tremendous step for artificial intelligence, what they solved is a very small part of the kind of reasoning, the thinking that the human brain does. It's a full information game, turn-based, where the rules are clearly defined. The whole problem is compressed down into a very special uh, domain. And when you think about it, the human brain is really not very good at that. That's why we uh, that kind of uh, game solving. That's why people that play Go or play chess very well need to be very intelligent, need to train for many years. Uh, so what the human brain, however, uh, what we can't do with a computer yet are the things that we take for granted. And that's really the paradox of AI. So we don't have a general vision system that I can give a picture of this room and then it will say, okay, there's a chair, there's a camera, there's a wall with a poster on it, uh, there are lights, there's a, uh, some sort of stair, and I don't know what this is going to be, uh, things like that. So but that also makes sense from an evolutionary point of view because the abstract thought that is necessary in order to do things like play chess or play Go is a fairly recent invention. The writing, which was sort of the first abstract expression, was invented by the Sumerians about 4,000 years ago. But our species, Homo sapiens, is 200,000 years old. So 98% of the time of our evolution, we weren't thinking about trying to play chess or trying to play Go. 98% of the time, we were trying to figure out how to deal with the physical world, with the three-dimensional world. Things like, this is a tiger, don't go near it, because if you do, it will kill you. Or, this is a fruit you can eat. Uh, this is how you can climb a tree. This is how you need to control your arms and legs in order not to fall off when you're trying to balance off something. And because of that, I think that it's, it's poorly understood by the general public that, in fact, the kind of tasks that we take for granted turn out to be much harder on a computer than playing chess or playing Go. Not only can the best teams in the world develop programs that can beat the world champion, but most uh, of my graduate students can write a computer program that can beat about 80% of the people in the world playing chess just because most people are very bad at playing chess, uh, not because my students are very smart, which they are actually. <laughs> And it's one of the things that the computer programs are also very bad at, is dealing with situations that it didn't foresee. So if I play chess against Kasparov, then surely I will lose. But if I replace his queen with a yellow rubber duck, then surely he will say something. Whereas the computer will just keep blindingly, keep playing on and on and on. It will not notice that there's anything weird going on. Instead of having a queen, now he has a rubber duck or something like that. So that's why we decided to come up 
with challenges for the robot, benchmark problems for our research that involved manipulating the physical world. And of course, it wasn't just me, it was a whole bunch of other researchers uh, worldwide in the early uh, 2000s. And we felt, or we are in a similar position than uh, the early pioneers of automotive design, automotive engineering. Um, most people know about Daimler and Benz, the first uh, two that built the combustion engine personal car. Uh, fewer people will know about uh, Emil Jalinek, uh, probably nobody here. Uh, you've probably heard his daughter's name, though, Mercedes. He was the first, one of the first race car drivers. That's one of the first things that they did with cars. Because they didn't have roads and gas stations or anything like that, but what they did figure out was, if we want to improve those, we better compete against each other. We need to see how fast can they go, how far can they go, how can we make them more robust. And so we do the same thing with our robots. And we designed a uh, decathlon for humanoid robots because to us, that's really at the heart of human intelligence. So we have different events. The top left is a stepping field. So the robots, humanoid robots, fully autonomous, no human control at all, uh, need to walk over an uneven surface, not just a flat floor like here or on the ground there. Um, that's been pretty much solved, but now we're looking at uneven surfaces. We throw coins at the robot to make it try and balance better. Uh, there's a marathon event, the second picture, uh, the robot has to walk 400 meters with a single battery charge. So you need to come up with a very power efficient walking gait and the robot needs to be able to understand signs and figure out it needs to turn left here, needs to turn right there. Uh, there's a sprint event, three meters forward, three meters uh, backward. Uh, there's a soccer competition. Uh, this year we also introduced long jump for the first time, which is an important step towards running robot. Right now, if you look at these robots, uh, the design is very stiff, but nothing really in nature is completely stiff. So these kind of robots, if they're trying to run, the impact during the running phase is going to damage the gears. And they don't have enough power in their electric motors in order to really jump off for the flight phase during a run. So what we need is a new design, new materials for robot designs that allow us to absorb an impact, have some compliance, dampen the impact, and store that energy so that we can release it, which is exactly what you need us while you're running. Then we have um, basketball, which is all about object manipulation, picking up a small ball and then dunking it into uh, the basket, and there's a three-point line and a five-point line and things like that. Now, one of the things that I'm really looking forward to, which I believe will still be several years away, maybe five, is to actually have the first humanoid robot that can dribble a ball. That will require even much better motor control and visual acuity for how to balance the ball. And then we also have an obstacle run, the obstacle run is basically a navigation challenge. The robot enters a field with an unknown environment. There's walls and steps and um, things that the robot is, are, is not allowed to touch. And there's also a gate, so it needs to crawl, uh, recognize the gate, crawl underneath the gate, stand up behind it, and then walk towards the, um, the, the finish line. And uh, the last two events uh, I will try and demonstrate. This will be um, a little bit of an experiment, I guess. Uh, in show business, they say don't work with animals and with children. Uh, that's only because they didn't have robots when they came up with these rules, because robots can be even more uh, temperamental than children. So here, our first robot, one of the challenges is uh, climbing a ladder. This is on an intermediate step towards actual wall climbing. So one of the events that we want to introduce in the future is uh, complete wall climbing. Here the challenge is for the robot to figure out all the different hands, holes, and foot positions that uh, could be there. And um, because at the actual competition, the rung spacing, the angle, all of this is unknown 
uh, to the robot. We just made it run here a little bit faster. And he's running on an internal program? Yeah. Okay. yeah, they're fully autonomous. They have a little computer on board. They use a vision camera in order to detect the environment around them. And they uh, need to do all the thinking, all the power, everything has to be on board. So they are fully autonomous robots. And the other robot that we have here is, uh, so this is actually Jennifer. Um, she's also been participating in ice hockey and alpine skiing is some of the other tricks that we taught her. And uh, here's Clara. Clara is going to do a weightlifting. If she decides to actually do it. Okay, Jennifer did her job, Clara is taking a break. Um, so, one of the things, so we've been competing at international robot competitions for a while. I think it's an excellent way to motivate your students, to validate your research, to form connections and networks with other researchers worldwide. Uh, it's a very nice community. Everybody feels like they're contributing their small part towards something greater. And we've also been lucky that we did quite well at these competitions. So in 2013, we won the Euro Cup event in Shah Alam in Malaysia. And so sometimes I get asked, I say, well, what actually makes a winning team? And the interesting thing about that is that first, clearly, okay, now Clara is doing her thing. <laughs> so Clara, take it away. Now for the weightlifting, we didn't just want to measure the torque on your shoulder servos. It's really a balancing challenge. So the robot needs to walk with the weight low first, then lift it up above the head, and then walk another 50 centimeters with the weight above the head. So the, uh, by moving the weight, the center of mass changes dramatically. So the robot needs to compensate for a different walking gait. So that brings me back to what it takes to uh, have a winning team. The one of the thing, of course, is technical skills. I like robotics because <coughs> to do well in robotics, you need to understand the mechanical engineering aspects, the electrical engineering aspects, and the computer science aspects. Um, and that makes you an excellent problem solver. That's why I get lots of calls from companies asking me whether I have any students graduating. Um, because they're, they're quite, they have many different problem-solving skills. They can look at a problem from many different angles. Whereas if you, all you have is a hammer, then every problem will look like a nail to you. So technical skills are important, but what's even more important for a winning team is to have attitude. And I don't mean the cliche one, you must believe that you can do it, something like that. What I mean is you need to have a scientific attitude. In 2011, when we were at the competition, a student walked up to me and said, Jackie, uh, the basketball is bulletproof. And now you've just seen Clara. These robots are never bulletproof. This worked 100 times in the lab before we did it. Uh, of course, at TEDx, it decided to not walk, work. So well, I asked him, well, what did you test? Oh, I tried it from here to there five times it scored. I said, well, did you try it the other way around? No. Did you try it with lots of people in the images? No. Did you try it with no people in the images? No. Did you try it with the lights turned on? No. But this kind of flexibility is crucial when you're trying to perform with your robots on an unknown stage in an unknown environment. So at that point, I already knew we would not do very well that year. 2013, the same student comes up to me and he says, the weightlifting, Jackie, don't expect too much because we tried. And it walks there and it works there. And we tuned the walking gate for this. And we had it walk the other way. It's still a little bit flaky. It works most of the time. But if we're not lucky, then we will have a problem. And I tried it with the light. 
and I tried it without the light. And there's still some issues that I think I can solve, but I'm not 100% sure. So don't expect too much. At that point, I knew we're going to do well. That's why we won in 2013. Because instead of having the attitude of trying to say, oh, I want to do the minimum amount of work to prove that my system sort of works, my student was a real scientist. He was trying his best to try and make the system fail. And if you try really hard to break your system, and you can't, then you have something interesting. So thank you all very much for your attention. <laughs>